The Capuchin order can trace its roots to the early years of the 13th century, when St. Francis of Assisi turned away from a prosperous merchant background and urged his followers to live simply, preaching penance and poverty. In the early 16th century, a Franciscan friar, Matteo da Bascio, felt a call to return to a very strict observance of the rule of St. Francis. With papal consent, Matteo and his companions sought to follow St. Francis's teachings more closely. They reshaped the hoods of their habits, adopted a harsh lifestyle, and became known as Scapuccini, or hermits. Over time, their name was changed to Capuchin. St. Francis was the first religious founder to direct his followers to preach amongst unbelievers. This message remained close to the hearts of Capuchins. By 1566, the Capuchin community was strong enough to follow this direction when they were entrusted with the mission of Crete. As the order grew, it spread across Europe, each community reaching into a new area. The Capuchins first came to Ireland in 1615. Despite religious persecution, they formed a separate province in 1733. This status was temporarily lost in the mid-19th century, but was regained in 1885. Vocations grew, and by 1910, the Irish province was ready to begin reaching out overseas. Friars of the Capuchin order are not sent abroad. When the province receives a request for religious personnel from overseas, volunteers respond to the call. Individuals like Jeremiah Joseph O'Reilly had gone abroad from the Irish province during the 19th century. But it wasn't until 1910 that the province formally accepted areas of responsibility outside Ireland. In America, many thousands of white settlers had gone to stake mining and ranching claims in the West, especially since the building of the railroads in the mid-19th century. The Native Americans were pushed into reservations. Bishop O'Reilly of Baker City, Oregon, made a request to the Irish province for assistance. He had large areas in his care that were sparsely populated, and too few religious men to serve these communities. He asked for Irish priests to take over these parishes. Brother Luke Sheehan was one of the first to answer this request. One man gave his own horse to Brother Luke, which allowed him to cover hundreds of miles visiting his widely spread congregation. Wherever they went, the Irish Capuchins worked with people who were on the periphery of society. Even in the land of the free, Roman Catholics were often subjected to prejudice and persecution. The friars also ministered to the populations of Indian reservations and increasingly to poor immigrant communities. In 1929, the Irish province's overseas work spread to Africa. In Cape Town, South Africa, the Irish Capuchins worked closely with the marginalised population, the poor, white, mixed race and black residents. Moving to Zambia, formerly northern Rhodesia, in 1931, the Capuchins were initially confined to areas not already claimed by Protestant missionaries. Foreign religious communities brought education and health care services to the widely dispersed population, and the government wished as many people as possible to benefit from their presence. Brother Casimir Butler, who had previously worked in America, led the province into an area called Barotsi land. Twenty-three tribes lived here, each with its own language and culture. The native tribes had their own concept of spirituality, very different from Western religions. Although the people were warm and welcoming, the friars had to learn to interpret their ways as well as their languages. Here, the Irish province was involved in creating an infrastructure. When they arrived, there were few roads in Barotsilan, and the friars travelled either by river or on foot. Mission stations were usually established by one or two friars. However, once a site was established, other friars would arrive. And it was through cooperation with other orders, especially religious sisters, and with dedicated lay volunteers from Ireland and from Zambia, that each mission developed. Fledgling Christian communities usually established a school as well as a church. Very often, orders of sisters would operate hospitals, 
girls' schools, orphanages, and leprosariums. Development work extended to drainage and irrigation projects, the establishment of model farms, and the building of bridges and clearing of rough roads. Trade schools were sometimes established to teach crafts such as brick making and carpentry. The friars also set up outstations with mass centers and schools to serve more remote villages. As well as establishing the local church, religious orders always hoped to implant their particular charism within Africa. As governments took more control over education and healthcare provision, the order has been able to focus more on formation, accepting local vocations and training these friars. The more recent establishments of the Irish province in New Zealand and South Korea are different kinds of ministries. With a very urban focus, the primary emphasis has been on pastoral work and implantation of the order. As in America, the Irish friars in New Zealand originally preached mostly to a white, pioneering community who were building cities, and now serve a racially mixed community. South Korea presents a different challenge, as so many different philosophies are strong in Korean society. Buddhist, Confucian and Tao teachings are long established, and Protestant Christianity is also practiced. For about 200 years, Roman Catholicism has been kept alive mostly by lay people. The Irish Capuchins were welcomed to Seoul by the Columban Fathers, who helped ease them into their new life. Over the years, Irish friars have also worked in various places outside the province's missions. Brother Sylvester Mulligan became Archbishop of Simla in India in 1937 and was joined there soon after by brothers Declan, Xavier and Theodore for a number of years. Brother Jarlath Goff went to the island of St Helena in 1957 and Vianney Cashel went to the Lebanon in the 60s. Close cooperation has always been a feature of the Irish Capuchins work in developing Christian communities. They work with priests, religious sisters, catechists, teachers, and both local and expatriate volunteers. Today, the Irish friars overseas work with the impoverished, immigrants, refugees, addicts, and people infected with HIV and AIDS. They provide counseling, spiritual guidance, and practical help. They also work in parishes, prisons, and formation centers, with secular Franciscans, with the old and with the young. The mission office in Dublin continues to support Irish friars overseas. Fundraising and other support work is coordinated by the mission secretary, who is appointed by the province. Of the province's overseas centres, the Zambian mission and South Korea rely most heavily on Ireland for support. The Irish Capuchins overseas have inspired many young men to join the order. And so it is that they look to the future with confidence confident that the Lord will continue to bless the seeds planted by so many great men and women in far-off lands over the last century. Confident, too, that these seeds will in turn bring forth fruit in abundance.